In addition to pride, our landscapes and those of our neighbors can inspire other emotions. Those who find gratification in manicured lawns may feel embarrassed to be associated with nearby properties that look ungroomed. Lawn lovers may feel mortified to have their visitors perceive some portion of their neighborhood as looking abandoned or occupied by lazy social deviants. On the other hand, those who prize ecological landscapes may feel repugnance at the sight of neighbors who mow and spray poisons over every inch of their yard. Environmental gardeners and their visitors may perceive lawn-dominant neighbors as wasteful, toxic, and ecologically illiterate. Preoccupation with those who are different from ourselves can create emotional stress. The owners of lawns may fear plants they don't recognize. The owners of organic landscapes may fear the pesticides and pollution forever discharged by neighbors laboring to keep nature at bay. While you may consider your neighbor's landscape a personal nuisance, legally it probably would not be judged a public nuisance. Lawn chemicals are sold legally. Nurseries sell all kinds of plants and seeds legally. If you have a manicured lawn and feel stressed with the view of a wild-looking landscape, consider erecting a blockade fence or planting a shrub border to screen your view. If you are growing a naturalized landscape, the presentation of a straight border may alleviate tensions with your neighbors. Good fences may or may not make good neighbors, but you can hope they foster civility. When neighbors can no longer agree to disagree, government may be asked to resolve neighbor-on-neighbor -neighbor conflicts by defining the parameters of what is acceptable behavior. Here are some guidelines for officials who are called upon to write new ordinances or overhaul old ones. Defer to the latest land management advisories from your state's Department of Natural Resources and county naturalists and horticulturists. Avoid borrowing language from dated ordinances. The environment and our knowledge base are not the same as they were 40 to 50 years ago. As example, this almost laughable wording from a 1960s ordinance, which sadly is still on the books in multiple communities. No person shall permit to grow English charlock, harmful barberry, buckhorn plantain, all of which cause hay fever in human beings, exhale unpleasant or noxious weed odors, or conceal filthy deposits, whatever that means. As Town of Vernon, Wisconsin Weed Commissioner Tom Krishan noted while developing a new invasive species ordinance in his community and finding a number of municipalities with this same ordinance, none of the municipalities lists plants by scientific name. Some of the common names mentioned are not known to the state or barium, so the intention of identity cannot even be determined. So, use standardized criteria and taxonomic nomenclature so site conditions can be documented and reported accurately, and then correlated with an appropriate course of action, such as a directive to use one of the DNR's recommended control methods. Do not leave interpretation to the vagaries of artistic impression. Words like weed, rank, overgrown, or even natural landscape are nebulous and subjective. Use the science. That's what it's there for. Specify why vegetation comes under control jurisdiction, such as pruning for maintenance of traffic sight lines for safety, or removal of a named invasive species due to environmental degradation. If you're going to have vegetation laws at all, 
Make sure your municipality has the personnel qualified to identify vegetation and direct the enforcement of your ordinances, or budget to hire a botanist to do site evaluations. If ordinances refer to grasses, define them by name rather than by category since grasses may fit into more than one designation. Most native grasses are considered ornamental. Some ornamentals are non-native and some ornamentals are invasive. Fescues may be found in traditional turf mixes or in no-mow blends. No-mow grasses are a popular choice with many who choose a low-maintenance, less manicured yard. Additionally, plants that look like grasses might be other species of plants altogether. Old-fashioned grass height ordinances will not suffice in this age of ecological landscaping and designer-designated ornamental grasses. Burden of Proof Old ordinances used to stipulate, where there is a disagreement between the municipality and the property owner, it shall be the property owner's responsibility to show proof of the appropriateness of the plant species. The problem with this posture of guilty until proven innocent is that if and when the property owner's hired botanist does prove appropriateness, the property owner can construe the municipality's action as harassment. Better to take a modern approach. If a complaint is filed by a citizen or the municipality against a property, the burden of proof lies with the complainant to establish that a health or safety hazard exists. A benefit of this construct is that requiring the complainant to produce the expert testimony may reveal to the complainant that they have no foundation for their grievance, thus terminating the situation before it can even become an issue. Enforce ordinances uniformly. If an ordinance is enforced only when a neighbor files a complaint, while similar properties are not policed in a like manner, your municipality can be sued for inequitable enforcement. On another note, some old ordinances ban brush piles. In the 21st century, with dwindling natural areas, brush piles are prized for their wildlife value. The National Wildlife Federation, the Humane Society, and the Minnesota DNR even instruct on how to build habitat brush piles. This is an example of how legislation needs to keep pace with the natural sciences. Ultimately, government cannot regulate to resolve everyone's emotional issues. There are circumstances under which all that officials can do is recognize a citizen's complaint and inform them that some conflicts are simply personal and do not demand legal intervention. I'm Joy Busloff. My husband Dan Saban and I own the Big Ben home referenced in earlier segments. Dan bought the place about 40 years ago, and we renovated it all by our own hands. A few years ago, we inherited this landmark place where I now sit, about 15 miles from Big Bend. These days, we apply ourselves to restoring this 140-year-old schoolhouse and its landscape. And grasses? They don't just grow outside here. Treasuring the native ones, I stenciled their likenesses onto our ceiling as one of my first projects. We rent out our Big Bend home now, and part of what attracted our current tenant to our place was its landscape. As a retired gardener for the state, he recognized all the plants 
and was delighted to have a bit of land where he could putter and enjoy nature's diversions. I'm going to tell you now about an incident with Big Bend officials that occurred a month ago and which provided the impetus for the production of this program. While I do, I'm going to run a series of screenshots from some of the many city websites that recommend residents mow less and grow green. Now that story. My friend John, a member of Wild Ones, asked me to address his fellow public safety commissioners about vegetation regulations. I expected, going into that public meeting, to assist in the development of a state-of-the-art ordinance or encourage this little village of just 1,300 to simply not create new legislation if they didn't have the staff and budget to do site assessments. I think it's safe to say the three other commissioners didn't care to have me challenge their way of thinking. The takeaway message from all three that night was four inches. Each of them said it more than once in reference to a mowing mandate. I pressed one commissioner for details. Are you differentiating between grasses, flowers, and shrubs? All he said in response was, four inches. You are not coming onto my property and mowing my grasses, I insisted. No, said another commissioner. We will make you mow. Do you live here? the man asked me. I own a home here, I began saying before he cut me off. Do you live here? he demanded. No, I said. Then you can't say anything, he replied, and waved his arm at me as he turned his head away. Can't say anything? Well, of course I can. The more ignorance we encounter, the more important that we teach. <laughs>